Okay, so let's start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Wisonic Global Webinar. This is Charlie, International Marketing Manager from Wisonic Medical. So today we are very honored and proud to invite Professor Kessler to share with us his latest research. Before we start, let me introduce our special guest, Professor Frank Law, medical doctor. He is the Dean of Department of Anesthesiology, Fosan Hospital of Traditional Chinese Medicine. His hospital is very famous in China for its orthopedic medicine and has one of the best regional anesthesia team in China. So now let's welcome Professor Fulong Luo to give us a very brief introduction for Professor Paul Kessler. 也欢迎国内的各位老师 今天呢，因为是英文授课，所以也请大家尽量英文提问。谢谢。那我们有，那我们有请呃罗教授来给我们介绍一下，开始了教授。Okay, thank you, Charlie, and thanks, Wisonic, for inviting me as a guest of today's Deadline College online lecture. It's my great honor and great pleasure to be here as a guest, really. I once was a trainee specialized in regional anesthesia in Professor Kaiser's hospital about 10 years ago, I think about 10 years ago. I spent three months there. I've learned a lot from Professor Kessler. Not only the detailed skills in nerve blocks, but also the principles protocols and clinical rules in regional anesthesia, I think which benefited me a lot in my later clinical practice. That's wonderful memories for me in all my life, really. Thank you, dear professor. Now I'll give a brief introduction to Professor Kessler. Um, professor Kessler is board certified in anesthesiology, critical care medicine, pain therapy, and emergency medicine and was awarded professorship in anesthesia in 1998. He received his speciality training in anesthesiology at Johann Wolfgang Gott University, Frankfurt, Germany. Since February 2020, Professor Kessler is vice chairman of the clinic of anesthesiology, intensive care medicine, and pain therapy of the University Hospital Frankfurt. His clinical expertise focuses on regional anesthesia. He was co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed papers, review articles, case reports, and book chapters. Paul Kessler is a member of many national and international societies of anesthesia. From 2009 to 2014, he was chairman of the German Task Force of Regional Anesthesia. From 2009 to 2013, he was board member of the ISRA. And from 2014 to 2018, he was a German Zone representative in ISRA Council. He is currently the chair of the ISRA Cadaver Workshops. He will give us a wonderful lecture later. The topic is significance of the new tranquil blocks in regional anesthesia. A wonderful topic for all the anesthesiologists. Thank you, Mr. Kessler. Okay, now let's welcome dear Professor Paul Kessler. Let's welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we'll begin our lecture. Hello and good. Good afternoon in Europe. Good evening and good morning somewhere else in the world. My name is Paul Kessler. I'm a member of the Clinic of Anesthesiology, Intensive Care Medicine and Pain Therapy at the University Hospital in Frankfurt, Germany. The topic I'm going to talk about today is significance of the new triangle blocks in regional This slide shows you some of the most common triangle blocks 
In the thoracic area, these are the paravertebral block, the intercostal block, pex blocks, the serratus anterior plain block, erector spinae plane block, radial lamina block, or the thoracolumbar interfacial plane blocks. And below you can see the first description of the block. In the abdominal area, we have the transverse yeah, abdominal yeah, like block, block iliac vinyl, iliac hypogastric block, fascia iliaca block, quadratus lumborum blocks, and the erector spinae plane block also. I will focus in my presentation today on the PEX block, serratus anterior plane block, erector spinae plane block, and quadratus lumborum block. Here you can see uh, how often these blocks are found in the uh, PubMed when you look at these blocks. And you can see the TAP block is one of the oldest blocks. First description came nearly in 2006. And you can see up to now we have nearly 1,000 publications of the TAP block. But you can also see that the newest one is the ESP block. First description comes from uh, autumn 2016. And up to now we have nearly 500 publications on the ESP blocks. What is uh, common to all these blocks is that the, these are interfacial plane blocks. These are no classical nerve blocks, though you don't need a nerve simulator to do these blocks. You can do it in the awake or anesthetized patient. These, most of the blocks are analgesic blocks and no anesthetic blocks. And uh, what is also common to all these blocks, these are inconsistent in their success rate and they have a low complication rate. We also have to constate that many of these, for many of these blocks, we only have case reports or case studies, and only for a few ones, we have randomized controlled studies or systemic reviews. These are no nerve blocks in the classical sense, and for most of them, nearly the ultrasound technique is the method of choice when you do these kind of blocks. Here you can see a cross-sectional through, uh, and you can see where the probe is placed when you do the blocks for the rectus sheath block. On the left side, the block, the, the, the probe is placed just anteriorly for the PEX or the TAP block. The probe is placed in the flank, and for some others as the QLB or the ESP block, the probe is placed more closer to the midline. This here shows you how the block works. The target of these blocks are the thoracoabdominal spinal nerves. And the uh, one part of the spinal nerve is the ventral ramus with the lateral cutaneous branches for the lateral side and the anterior cutaneous branches, which innovates the anterior part of the trunk. And we have the dorsal ramus, which innervates the uh, muscular of the back and the skin of the back. And in addition, we have the sympathetic trunk, which communicates with the rami, rami communicants with the spinal nerve. To understand what these blocks can do, it's important to know where you place your local anesthetics. Here you can see the spinal cord. You see the dorsal root and the ventral root, which form the spinal nerves. And you can see the sympathetic fibers from the uh, visceral organs, which uh, communicate with the spinal nerves. And the spinal nerves end in the ventral ramus and the dorsal rami. If you place local anesthetics lateral from this line, so you will produce only a somatic analgesia. That means that you have an analgesia for skin, muscle, bones, and the parietal pleura and pleuritoneum. This can be achieved by the intercostal block, tap blocks, packs, rectal sheath block, iluinguinal, erector spinae, and quadratus lumborum blocks. When you do these blocks, you will have an opioid sparing effect, so these are only analgesic blocks. But if you place local anesthetics medial from this line, you will produce a somatic and visceral analgesia. That means, in addition to the former one, you will also have analgesia for the visceral pleura and peritoneum and the visceral organs. So, 
This can be achieved by the spinals or thoracic epidural by the paravertebral block. But what about erector spinae plane block and the quadratus lumborum block? If you do, if you have a somatic and visceral analgesia, you have an you will have an opiate free patient at the after the operation. But these blocks can also be used for the for a surgical uh, anesthesia. You can do. Uh, thoracic and abdominal uh, operations without general anesthesia when you use only these kind of So let me start with the PEX blocks, which are blocks for breast and chest wall surgery. We have three different kind of blocks, PEX1, PEX2, and serratus and tuberous plane. So all these blocks are first described by Rafael Blanco, PEX1 in 2011, PEX2 in 2012, PEX3 or serratus and tuberous plane block in 2000. Here you can see the innovation of the female breast. Uh, important are that uh, included are fibers from the cervical plexus, the supraclavicular nerves from from the uh, brachial plexus, the lateral and the medial pectoral nerves and the nerves from the, uh, the, the the branches from the spinal nerves, the lateral and the medial branches from the thoracic intercostals. This shows you what is important to know from the anatomical side when you do pec block. You can see here the pec major muscle, pec minor muscle, the serratus anterior muscle, and you can see the long thoracic nerve and the lateral cutaneous branches and the medial cutaneous branches of the spinal nerves. For the PEX-1, you have to place a probe, the uh, transfer, uh, linear probe, uh, just below the clavicle. For the PEX-2 blocks, you move the, the probe more distally at the level of the fourth ribs, and the serratus anterior plane block is done at the level of the fifth rib in the mid-axillary line. The PEX-1 block will block the medial and the lateral pectoral nerves. The PEX-1 blocks has no skin innovation. Indications are plastic breast surgery, port implantation. Here you can see another anatomical view of the lateral and the medial pectoral nerve, and the probe is placed just below the clavicle. Here you can see the ultrasound picture of a PEX-1 block. The you see the pec major muscle, pec minor muscle below the axillary artery and the vein, and the needle is advanced, in this case, from lateral to medial. And the end of the tip is placed in the plane between the major and minor pec muscle. Here in this video, you can see how the low anesthetic is spreading in the interfacial plane between the pecs major and minor muscle. Easily to identify uh, is the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery, which lies in the same plane as the pectoral nerves. The next one is the PEX2 block. With this block, you will block the lateral cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves T2 to 6, the long thoracic nerve, which innovates the serratus anterior muscle, and indications are together with the PEX-1 block, tumor resection of the breast or mastectomy. Here you see the anatomical picture. The, for the PEX-2 block, the probe is moved more uh, caudally at the level of uh, the fourth rib. This picture shows you the relevant zonal anatomy of a PEX-2 block. The local anesthetics is placed above as a PEC-1 block and below the PEC minor muscle. And uh, the, the puncture comes from medial to lateral or from lateral to medial. The medial is at once from medial to lateral. The first injection point is below the PEC minor muscle. Now the local anesthetic is ejected in the plane between minor and serratus anterior muscle. The needle is retracted between the 
minor and major muscle, and this is a so-called PEC-1 block. The last one of the PEX block is the serratus anterior plane block. Which this, with this block, you will block the intercostal nerves, T2 to 9, long thoracic nerves, the thoracodorsal nerve, which you know it's a latissimus dorsi muscle, and the intercostal brachialis nerve. Indications for these blocks are, for example, major breast surgery or lateral thoracic wall surgeries. Here, the relevant anatomy. The probe can be placed in the longitudinal position in the mid axillary line at the level of the fifth ribs, or what I prefer, in the transverse, uh, transverse position in the mid axillary line. With this position, it's easy to identify the origin of the latissimus dorsi when you move the probe posteriorly. There are two options to perform the serratus anterior plane block. First, you can do a superficial block when the local anesthetic is placed above the satyrus anterior muscle, or you can do a deep satyrus anterior, anterior plane block when the local anesthetic is placed below, or you can do a combination of superficial and deep. The question is which blocks is more sufficient, superficial or a superficial injection or a deep injection. There is no, there are no clear data showing that the one uh, block is better than the other ones. In this publication from Briarcha, there he could show that the the deeper, the deep injection below the serratus anterior was more sufficient. Here you can see uh, a scheme how the block is done. You see the latissimus dorsi uh, muscle, the serratus anterior muscle. You can identify the ribs. You see the pleura, and you see the position of the needle for the superficial. And here, the needle is advanced for a superficial block. You see the latissimus dorsi is uh, lifted up, and you can see on the left side, I show you again, on the left side, you can see the thoracodorsal artery. After finishing this, you can do an, a deep SIP block. You can see here how the serratus anterior is lifted up of the sixth rib. What is the evidence for the PEX blocks? This shows you, this picture shows you a meta-analysis. PEX2 blocks versus IV opioids for breast cancer surgery, and you can see that the oral morphine consumption is lower for the PEX blocks compared to the systemic analgesia. Comparing the pain scores of the PEX2 block with the systemic opioids, the pain scores were lower during the first 24 hours at different time points for the PEX2 blocks. In this study, the serratus anterior plane block was compared with IV opioids in patients undergoing thoracoscopic surgery, and the authors could find that also the worst pain was lower in patients receiving serratus anterior pain block, and also the uh, patients were highly satisfied with the serratus anterior plane block compared to IV opioids. And another study showing also that the serratus anterior pain block was very effective uh, as an analgesic after thoracic surgery. Here this SAP block was compared to standard IV opioids and also the pain scores and the morphine consumption were lower in the SAP group. Comparing PEX2 with uh, erector spinae plane block for radical mastectomy, the authors could demonstrate that for the PEX block, the duration of analgesia and the morphine requirement in the first 24 hours was lower and also the pain scores were 
post-operatively lower for most time points for the PEX block. And the conclusion was that the PEX2 was more effective than the erector spinae pain block in terms of post-operative analgesia after radical mastectomy. And this is not surprising because with the PEX blocks, you also block not only the, uh, the, the lateral cutaneous branches of the spinal nerves, but also the pectoral nerves of the, the brachial plexus, which is not the case when you do an erector spinae blade. Comparing the SAP block with the paravertebral block versus systemic opioids for video thoracoscopic, uh, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, you can demonstrate that the paravertebral block and serratus block are equivalent regarding the morphine consumption and that both blocks are better in pain scores compared to IV opioids. So there was no difference in this study between the paravertebral block and the serratus. And finally, in this study, uh, where the serratus anterior plane block was compared with a thoracic epidural analgesia for thoracotomy pain, uh, it could be demonstrated that the hemodynamic profile uh, was more stable in the serratus anterior plane block. These are the uh, rounded circles and the, the, the pain scores are similar for both groups. So the conclusion from the study was that the serratus anterior pain block was safe and effective in treating thoracotomy pain. What are the indications for the PEX and serratus blocks? For the PEX for unblocks, are, these are minor uh, breast surgeries or pacemaker or port implantation. For PEX2 blocks, it's more uh, invasive breast surgeries, radical mastectomy. And for the serratus plane blocks, major breast surgery, axillary lymph adenectomy, pectum excavatum, or the so called NAS procedure, or thoracotomy, or rib fractures. What are the clinical applications and the conclusion for the practice? The uh, mode of action of all these blocks is very clear and understandable. We already have some randomized controlled trials showing the effectiveness of these blocks. Uh, you can use ropivacaine in a dose in a concentration of 0.2 or 0.5%, or you can use bupivacaine. For PEX1, you should use 10 ml of local anesthetic PEX220 ml and for the serratus anterior plane block 20 to 40 ml. If you perform a bilateral blocks, you should uh, not exceed the recommended maximum uh, dose of local anesthetics, otherwise uh, last can be a problem. Catheter insertion is possible. If you insert catheter, you can use a uh, continuous rate of infusion of 0.2% of ropivacaine and 5 ml per hour. Probably a continuous infusion is not so effective as an intermittent bolus. This uh, applies for all kinds of triangle blocks and intermittent bolus or intermittent injection of a higher bolus of local anesthetics is probably more effective and a, as a continuous infusion or a patient controlled infusion mode. Block is very effective. We have comparative studies with uh, thoracic epidurals and paravertebral blocks, and the complication rate is rather. Complications are allergic injections, intravascular injections, last if you do a bilateral block. Nerve injury is rare because uh, in the plane where you inject the local anesthetics are the long thoracic or the thoracodorsal nerves. Vessel puncture can should be also very rare because you should know where your tip of the needle is and then you should avoid any kind of vessel puncture and also pleural puncture and neurotox are very rare complications. The next topic is the erector spinae plane block. You can see here the erector spinae muscle and this is not one muscle. The erector spinae muscle consists at least of three major muscle bellies, medial the spine spinalis, in the middle the longissimus, and laterally the iliocostalis lumborum muscle.
from the outside to the inside, we can find below the skin, that you can see on the left hand side, the uh, latissimus dorsi and the trapezius muscle. Below these muscles, you can find the rhomboid major muscle and below the rhomboid, uh, rhomboid major muscle, there lies the erector spinae muscle, which can be seen on the right hand side. This is the first description of the erector spinae plane muscles from nine, 2016 from Mauricio Ferrero from the Kijijin group. And this was two, were two case reports of a patient with neuropathic pain after rib fractures and rib metastasis. And the, the erector spinae block was done at a level of T5 and 20 ml of bupivacaine, 0.22% was injected, and they found a spread uh, posteriorly and anterolaterally between 2.3 to 2. And they also found that the contrast dye could be shown uh, in the area of the spinal nerves here at this level. And this would explain this, the covering of the lat anterior lateral parts of the chest. We know now that we can do an erectospinal plane block not only in a thoracic area at a level of T5, the ESP block can be done higher at the level of C7, T1, and at the level lower T1 and in the lumbar spine area. So this block seems to cover everything. It's a so-called all-rounder among the truncal blocks. You can use it for analgesia after thoracic surgery and abdominal surgery and upper limb surgery. Depending where you do your block, you can cover an area starting from the cervical to the lumbar area. This picture shows you how the ESP block is done. You see here the dorsal ramus of the spinal nerve on the left side, you can see it in the cross-sectional view. We use routinely a linear probe, which is placed paramedian in a longitudinal position. And the needle is advanced from cranial to caudal with the tip direction of the transverse process and then local anesthetic is injected. You can do it with a patient in the lateral sitting or prone position. On the right side, you see here the ultrasound picture. And here you can see the video. You see the trapezius muscle, erector spinae muscle, the transverse process, the needle is advanced to the transverse process. And when you are in the correct plane, you can see the erector spinae is lifted off the transverse process. Catheter insertion is also very easy because you advance the catheter in plane and the insertion can be followed up very nicely in the, with the ultrasound. The question is, how does the erector spinae uh, block work? Here you can see a cross-sectional view. You see the erector spinae muscle. You see the dorsal ramus with the medial lateral branch. You see the ventral ramus, you see the sympathetic trunk, and you see the advancement of the needle to the transverse process in the local anesthetics is always blocking the dorsal ramus of the spinal nerve. The question is, is local anesthetic flowing into the intercostal space or the paravertebral space or the epidural space? And producing by this complete some somatic and visceral analgesia. Many cadaver studies were done to answer this question. This is one showing that when you look for the cadavers, the ventral rami are not stained with contrast dye. Only the dorsal ramus here on the right side in the picture is, are stained with contrast dye. So the conclusion was there was no spread of dye anteriorly to the paravertebral space 
and the dorsal ramus involvement was posterior to the costal transverse for This is another uh, patient where 30 ml of bupivacaine with contrast dye were injected at T10. And uh, after 90 minutes, they made an uh, MRI and they found a sensory loss of T between T6, T12, over the anterolateral aspect of the left thoracic abdominal wall. And in the MRI, the authors found a contrast dye in the paravertebral space, in the intercostal space, and the circumferential around the epidural. So there was a clear paravertebral and intercostal signal intensity showing that contrast dye or local anesthetic was uh, in the... In another cadaver study, the authors compared a paravertebral block with an erectospenia plane block. They injected 20 ml of methylene blue at the level of T4, and they found that uh, after an erectospenia plane block, only in 60% the injectate spread into the uh, paravertebral space compared to 100% when they did a paravertebral block. So the spread into the paravertebral space was inconsistent. And many other uh, cadaver studies were done to look for the me mechanism of an erector spinal plane block. And you can see different results. Here you can see what you have seen before, only a spread a dorsal spread and a spread around the dorsal ramus. In this study, they could f demonstrate that local anesthetic, this is the light blue color, was found in the uh, paravertebral space. Here also this was the Schwarzman study. They found spread of uh, local anesthetics around the spinal cord and in the spinal nerve. In this study also, local anesthetic was found in the paravertebral space and the intercostal space and also here in this study. But you can see there is a high variability regarding the spread of local anesthetics when you do an erector spinae block. What are the mechanisms of action of an erector spinae plane block? What are the results that we have from cadaver studies? We know that a spread occurs in the dorsal rami in a craniocaudal direction which will uh, result in a sensory motor block of the dorsal chest wall. We also have seen an anteromedial spread in the, into the epidural space, which results in a spinal nerve block. We have seen an anterior spread into the paravertebral space with a sympathetic block, and also a laterally spread to the ventral rami, which causes an anterolateral block of the chest abdominal wall. But the open questions that remains are if we can see dye or contrast medium within the paravertebral space, the intercostal space or in the epidural space, does this automatically mean a well-working nerve block? I don't know. What is the evidence for the ESP? Reliable and validated is only that the ESP block the dorsal rami. And the additional block of nerves as the, such as the spinal nerves or the, the sympathetic nerve is inconsistent and unpredictable, but it would be very nice if we have a block of these other nerves. What you can always see when you do an erector spinal plane block is the spread of local anesthetics in a craniocaudal direction. But more important is, if there, is there an anterior spread of local anesthetics so that the uh, spinal nerves and the sympathetic trunks are blocked in the paravertebral space. Here, an anatomical picture when the uh, erector spinae muscles are removed and you look from the back and you can see beyond the erector spinae muscle, there are a lot of many deep layers of intrinsic back muscles as the uh, rotator brevis and longus levator beta costarum. And you can see a lot of uh, ligaments, uh, mainly the superior costotransverse ligaments, 
which is important and which uh, runs from the uh, transverse process to the, the rib. And in between, and the rib there uh, exits the dorsal ramus, the spinal nerve. And this costal transverse for Raymond is very important because this may might be one of the mechanisms how local anesthetics this is, is injected here around the transverse process enters the uh, the spinal nerve or the paravertebral spine. The discrepancy between patients and cadaver is partly based on the fact that the diffusion of local anesthetics in cadavers do not allow to examine the effect of respiratory movement or muscle tension or relaxation and body positioning if we do a block in the lateral position, the prone position, or in the sitting position. We also have start comparative studies between ESP blocks and IV opioids for video-assisted torcoscopic surgeries. And you can see here uh, the fentanyl consumption, uh, rescue analgesics, as well as the pain scores were better in the ESP block group. And this was a comparative study of ESP block and paravertebral block for thoracotomy pain. And you can see here similar results regarding the pain scores and uh, uh, less hypotension bradycardia uh, in the uh, ESP group. So the conclusion was no difference between both blocks, but a better side effect profile for the ESP. Erectus spinae plane block can be also done in the lumbar area. F for this area, you need a convex probe because it's a deeper block. You advance the needle to the transverse process and uh, you inject your local anesthetics to block the uh, lumbar nerves of the lumbar plexus. This is an example of the patient at the lateral position. And this is the ultrasound picture that you can expect. It's the same position of the probe that you also use for the uh, a lumbar plexus block when you do the so-called trident technique. You can see here the transverse processes and the needle is advanced through the latissimus dorsi muscle and the erector spine. This is the video of a lumbar erector spine plane block. You can see the tip of the needle is in contact with the, spine, with the transverse process and then local anesthetic is injected. And it's not so clear uh, as you have seen it in the thoracic area uh, that the erector spinae muscle is lifted up. There exist many case reports and case series of the use of the lumbar erector spinae plane block in patients undergoing hip surgery or proximal femur surgeries. We also have a study looking at the combination of lumbar erector spinal plane block and transmuscular quadratus lumborum or a comparison of uh, lumbar erector spinal plane block and uh, transmuscular quadratus lumborum block for post-operative analgesia in hip and proximal. What are the clinical applications and the conclusion for the practice? The, para the erector spinal plane block is a kind of paraspinal block which is performed more superficial and uh, therefore less risky than a paravertebral block. Indications are all procedures where analgesia is needed from the cervical to the lumbar area. The mode of action is not yet fully understood and we only have a few randomized controlled studies. If we have somatic and visceral analgesia, it depends on if local anesthetics is entering the paravertebral place or not. It's a high volume block and usually we, sh we should use at least 20 ml of local anesthetics, for example, 0 0.3, 0 0.375 or 0.5% raw pivacaine, or you can use also bupivacaine. The insertion of a catheter is possible. Uh, if you use a catheter, you can use raw pivacaine 0.2% in a continuous rate of 5 ml per hour. 
regarding the effectiveness, uh, more comparative studies are needed with the so-called gold standard. Uh, these are the uh, terrific epidurals and the paravertebral block. The complication rate is rather low. Limitations of this block and of the results and studies or case reports we have just right now are the variability and inconsistency of this block. My conclusion is that this block is a block with a high potential. And very important is that the most significant advantage of the ESP block is its simplicity and safety. Another issue of my presentation are the quadratus lumborum blocks. These are blocks where the local anesthetics is injected in the planes around the quadratus lumborum muscle. The quadratus lumborum muscle is a muscle which origins from the 12th rib, the uh, transverse processes of L1 to L4, and the iliac First described as quadratus lumborum block 1 and 2 by Rafael Blanco already in 2007. A third option, the transmuscular quadratus lumborum block was, or tachea block, was first described by the Jens Borglum in 2013. This picture shows you uh, a cross-sectional view of a patient in the lateral position and it shall explain you where the uh, local anesthetics is injected for the different kind of quadratus lumborum blocks and uh, how it may work. You can see here the vertebral body. This is the psoas muscle in front of the transverse process. In behind, there is the erector spinae muscle. This the black uh, area is the thoracolumbalfascia, the posterior layer, the anterior layer. This is the latissimus dorsi muscle. And here are the abdominal uh, muscles, the obliquus, external, internals, and the transverse abdominis. Uh, convex probe is placed in the flank of the patient. And if you do a QL block one, the local anesthetics is uh, placed lateral from the quadratus lumborum block for the QL. B2 block, the local anesthetics is uh, placed uh, posterior to the quadratus lumborum. And if you do a transmuscular block, the nadal is advanced through the quadratus lumborum and the local anesthetics is placed in front of the local anesthetics. Nowadays, we shouldn't use no longer the, the nomenclature one or two. It's better to use the nomenclature lateral, posterior or anterior because from this nomenclature, you can uh, derive the position of the local anesthetic. These are MRI constructions of spread of contrast. And you can see when you compare the lateral with the posterior block, you can see in the posterior block, more of the contrast dye is uh, spreading to the, to the spinal nerves and probably also here to the paravertebral space. That means with the posterior block, you will have a deeper and more profound block. You will also not also have a somatic, but also we will also find a somatic and visceral. Performing a transmuscular anterior quadratus lumborum block means that we inject local anesthetics between the quadratus lumborum and the psoas muscle. And we expect that the local anesthetics will not stay in the lumbar area, but will also flow into the lower thoracic area via the lateral and medial accurate ligaments. In this sagittal image of a cadaver, the yellow line represents the flow of the dye, and you can see that the dye is entering the lower thoracic area, the diaphragma is represented with the blue color and behind the diaphragma you can see the local anesthetics. On the other hand, we know that after a transmuscular anterior quadratus lumborum blocks, uh, the uh, some nerves of the lumbar plexus and branches of the lumbar plexus are consistently blocked and this is not the case if you do a lateral or posterior quadratus lumborum block. Summarizing the data from the 
cadaver and uh, clinical studies, we can say that with after a lateral quadratus lumborum block, the dermatomes are covered from T12 to L1 after an posterior QLB from T9 to T12 L1 and after an, an anterior QLB from T6 to L3. The paravertebral space is only reached after an posterior and anterior quadratus lumborum blocks and uh, the uh, lumbar nerves or parts of the lumbar nerves are only blocked after an anterior quadratus lumborum block. The different quadratus lumborum blocks, the patient can be placed in a lateral position and the, a convex probe is placed in the flank of the patients. What you can expect then is that you can see here the vertebral body and the transverse process. In front of the transverse process, you see the psoas muscle. Top of the transverse process, the quadratus lumborum muscle. And in behind of the transverse process, the erector spinae muscle. Lateral from the quadratus lumborum, the latissimus dorsi muscle. And in front, the three muscle layers of the abdominal muscles. If you perform a lateral quadratus lumborum block, the local anesthetics is placed lateral to the quadratus lumborum. The, for the posterior, the local anesthetic is placed in between of the latissimus dorsi and the quadratus lumborum muscle. And for the trans, uh, anterior uh, quadratus lumborum muscle, the needle goes through the quadratus lumborum and the local anesthetic is injected between the psoas muscle and the, the quadratus lumborum muscle. Block. You can advance the needle from posterior to anterior or from anterior to posterior. posterior. Here the lateral QLB block, you see the three, you identify the three muscle layer, external, internal and transverse abdominis muscle and the quadratus lumborum and the needle is advanced uh, anterior lateral. You can see here in front of the quadratus lumborum, the local anesthetics, the tip of the needle is placed and the local anesthetic is uh, anesthetic is injected. Here again, the typical picture you can see for the transmuscular approach, you uh, advance the needle from posterior to anterior and until you are in the right plane between the uh, psoas muscle and the here the needle is advanced. Now we are in the right plane. You can see the distinction of both muscles. Here you can see the spreading of the local anesthetics between the both muscles. For the posterior quadratus lumborum muscle, you have the same picture, you see the vertebral body, psoas muscle, erector spinae, latissimus dorsi, quadratus lumborum, and the needle is advanced uh, posterior to the quadratus lumborum in the plane between dorsi and quadratus lumborum. In this video, a needle tip dragging technology is used to identify the tip of the... When you are in the right plane, you inject the local anesthetic, and you see the distension of the both muscles, the latissimus dorsi and the quadratus lumborum. We also have some studies here for laparoscopic surgery. The uh, comparison of the posterior quadratus lumborum and the lateral transverse abdominal spleen block. And you could see the time until first rescue analgesia was used was much more longer for the QLB uh, for the posterior quadratus lumborum compared to the lateral top. And also you can see here that the uh, uh, thoracic dermatomes are more often blocked with the quadratus block. Here, the, the effectiveness of the posterior quadratus lumborum uh, for cesarean section compared to IV opioids. And you can see with the posterior quadratus lumborum block, the morphine consumption was reduced and the patient had a lower pain score. A comparative study of the posterior quadratus lumborum with the lateral transverse abdominis plane block 
for cesarean delivery confirms that the quadratosome worm block was more effective in reducing morphine consumption and demands up to 48 hours post-operatively. There's many other case reports or studies for different kind of uh, operations. You can see here for total hip arthroplasty, the effectiveness of uh, quadratus lumbo, a transmuscular quadratus lumborum block, again, transmuscular quadratus lumborum block for iliac crest bone harvesting, for femoral femoral bypass graft placement, uh, for nephrology. What is the evidence for the QLB techniques? Indications for the lateral QLB are lower abdominal surgeries, for the posterior QLB lower and upper abdominal surgeries, for the anterior quadratus lumborum lower upper abdominal surgeries and hip surgery, which uh, those should be used at least 20 ml of low, uh, row pivacaine, for example, 0.375% or uh, bupivacaine, Catheter are possible. Uh, you can use a continuous rate of 5 ml per hour of 0.2 raw pivacaine. What is the effectiveness? Comparative study are lacking. What are the risks and what are the complications? We don't know exactly. Enough. Let me summarize the significance of PEC serratus erector spinal plane or quadratus lumborum blocks in regional anesthesia. First of all, all these blocks are interfacial blocks, that means these are not classical nerve blocks. The technique of choice when you're doing these blocks is ultrasound guided technique. If you have an opiate free or opiate saving technique, depends on if you block only somatic or if you block somatic and visceral fibers. Effectiveness and spread of local anesthetic. We can say there's a lack of uh, consistency. All these blocks are unpredictable and uh, even if we are with the needle tip in the right plane and we see that the local anesthetics is spraying in the interfacial plane between two muscles, we cannot say this block will work 100% or not. Effectiveness, there is a validation, is depending. What are the indications for these blocks? Major procedures, when more effective and riskier procedures are contraindicated, such as thoracic epidurals or parietal block due to and anticoagulated patients, and also minor procedures when more effective or risky procedures are not indicated. The complications rate is rare, serious complications are really rare, and uh, in anticoagulated patients, what shall we do with these kind of blocks? We have not yet recommendations so far, but my, to my opinion, we can uh, follow a more liberal regimen than your Excel blocks when we do these kind of blocks. Thank you very much. Hello. Back again. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kessler, uh, for your insightful presentation. So uh, let's move let's move on to next uh, Q and A section, uh, which probably takes uh, twenty five minutes. I, I've seen many audience to ask questions uh, in here, but due to time limitation, I will choose some of them. So the qu first question is um, from a doctor. He is asking that. In our clinical practice, we found sometimes it's difficult to provide perfect or acceptable analgesia for patients with pelvic fractures, such as fracture of ileum, pubis, sacrum, and acetabulum. Uh, it's quite difficult to pronounce a very professional uh, vocabulary for me. <laughs> It seems very difficult to cover all of the nerves in a waiting this area with a single block. So how is your opinion? This is a very good question. So I think it's difficult to answer. If you have a pelvic fracture or a difficult pelvic fracture, uh, you have to block the uh, lumbar sacral plexus. That means with a single peripheral nerve block, you cannot achieve a whole analgesia-free patients. 
you have to do at least two blocks, a lumbar, you have to block the, the lumbar plexus and you have to block the, the sacral plexus. Of course, you can do it with one injection. This is the an epidural. You can do an epidural block in these patients, but an epidural to place in patients with pelvic fracture is uh, very difficult because already the positioning of the patient in the, to bring the patient in a lateral position after a pelvic fracture will be difficult. If you have a bilateral pelvic fracture, it's nearly impossible. If you have a, a unilateral pelvic fracture, you can turn the patient on the, the not uh, fractured side and it, then you can do your epidural and you can place a catheter. But you also have to keep in mind the epidural may be uh, a little bit contraindicated because uh, patients with pelvic fracture need a lot of blood, they need a lot of transfusions, and they are at a high risk of coagulation disorders postoperatively. And then if you have done a newer axle block like, a, uh, like an epidural, or if you have placed an epidural catheter, there is a higher risk of an uh, epidural hematoma. Therefore, if it's possible, you should do some kind of peripheral nerve blocks. As I mentioned before, you have to do, for a complete free uh, analgesic patient, you have to do two blocks. Maybe you can do a lumbar plexus block. So you have to pl place the patient on the lateral side and you can combine it with a high, a very proximal sciatic nerve block. Uh, this will work, maybe, but uh, indeed it's uh, a difficult decision and uh, in my practice we sometimes also combine a lumbar plexus block which covers only the lumbar area with a uh, anterior quadratus lumborum block because with this block you also cover the, uh, the lower thoracic uh, nerves and these are sometimes necessary because when you have the uh, uh, fractures at the level of the iliac crest maybe a pure lumbar plexus block will not be sufficient. Excellent, very detailed, yeah. So the second question for you um, is, as we know, triangle blocks are very effective in post-operative analgesia. I wonder if it can be used as a main anesthetic method during surgery, like a spine anesthesia or a dual anesthesia. As you have seen in my presentation, uh, most of the so-called uh, abdominal uh, thoracic triangle blocks are uh, blocks which provides uh, somatic analgesia. That means you can block uh, the nerve for the skin, for uh, maybe for the bone also, but not for the deeper organs. And therefore, these are only uh, suitable for post-operative analgesia. But you can do with these blocks, for example, uh, the iliac crest bonus harvesting. But if you want to do this, use this block as a, a sole anesthetic technique without general anesthesia, you must provide with these blocks also, in addition to the somatic analgesia, also a an, uh, visceral analgesia. And this can be uh, nicely done only with the neuroaxial blockades. But you can use also an erector spinal plane block and maybe the uh, posterior or anterior quadratus lumborum block. And we have a very few data for uh, the uh, thoracic erector spinal plane block using in patients undergoing videoscopic uh, uh, thoracoscopic surgery that this can be used as a sole technique. But it's always a matter, you cannot be sure if this block will work. And this is one, uh, this is also common to all these blocks. Even when you are with your tip of the needle in the right plane and you inject the local anesthetics and you can see the distension of the space between two muscles so you are correctly in the right plane. You cannot be sure that this block will work 100%. This is completely different if you do an ultrasound guided nerve block. When you see the nerve, you inject the local anesthetics, the local anesthetic is flowing around the nerve. You can say this block or this nerve is blocked by 100%. This is completely different with the uh, uh, interfacial plane blocks. This you must, you have to keep in mind. So for me, my preference would be that you use this block uh, more or less only for post-operative analgesia, not as a sole tech anesthesia technique. Okay, very good. So uh, 
The third question is also from the audience. Uh, he mentioned that triangle blocks are often very good for superficial pen, but sometimes are poor for the visual pen. Uh, visual pen. So, what's your opinion about it? For example, like uh, what's your optimal energetic protocol after the surgery of radical recession of rectal tensile and the uh, laparoscopy? I think the question is what is uh, our technique for colorectal surgery, for major colorectal surgery? In the past, this was always done as an open surgery, and an open surgery is very painful. So the gold standard for an open colorectal surgery was in the past, and I think is still now a thoracic epidural catheter. But uh, nowadays, many of these blocks are done well laparoscopically, and this means these are it's a so-called uh, uh, minimal and savvy technique, and this is part of the so-called so ERAS concept. It means intense recovery after surgery. Patients should be mobilized very early, and patients should have less pain. When you do uh, all the for all laparoscopic procedures, uh, you can be sure that the pain perception is much more lower compared to the open uh, surgeries. And therefore, when you do a laparoscopic procedure, uh, thoracic epidural would be too much. So we have now uh, uh, other alternatives. We have other uh, abdominal wall blocks. So there are uh, some studies show using the, the, the transverse abdominal plane block or the uh, quadratus umborum block or also the erector spinae plane block uh, as a uh, regional technique for analgesia after the laparoscopic colorectal surgery. And always, if you use uh, these uh, abdominal wall blocks, they should be part of a multimodal analgesia concept for post-operative patients. So you should use non-opioids, a lot of non-opioids as a base of analgesia. You should use perioperatively uh, uh, the triangle blocks. And uh, with these triangle blocks, probably you, you cannot uh, stop completely the uh, pain. You cannot make the patient pain-free. So you have use a small amount of opioids in addition to these patients. Okay, we're good. So the next question is a very um, technology, technique related. So uh, he asked that no root block may be the most reliable approach for an uh, energetic result in triangle blocks, but sometimes local anesthetics often diffuse into the spinal canal. So which may be very dangerous and even led to disaster. Is there any way to avoid this kind of a, a complication? Indeed, when we do a spinal or the epidural, it's, we wanted the local anesthetic to go into the spinal to, to block the spinal nerve. And when we uh, uh, paraspinal block, that means we inject local anesthetics more or less close to the spinal cord or to the spinal nerve. Uh, and sometimes we want to have that the local anesthetics uh, blocks the spinal canal. For example, when we do a paravertebral block, we inject uh, around 10 or 15 ml of local anesthetic in the paravertebral space, and the paravertebral space is open to the intervertebral foramen. So we accept that when we do a paravertebral block that the local anesthetics flow into the uh, foramen intervertebral and also block the spinal canal, but this is not of uh, clinical relevant. And I think if we do the newer, the paraspinal block, for example, the retrolaminar block, or we do an er uh, erectospinal plane block, we are moving more away uh, from the spinal cord and we are more distally from the spinal cord. And uh, I think even can, can, uh, if we can show or demonstrate in cadavers, that uh, some kind of local anesthetics is flowing into the spinal canal. The, the, the clinical relevance is, in my opinion, very low. So I have uh, no, I think there exists nearly no data that uh, this is a, a huge problem when you do the peripheral triangle blocks and the blocking of the spinal canal. All right. So the fifth, uh, the fifth question for you is that uh, blocks for post-operative anesthesia after thoracolumbar surgery. So which one is better? 
block uh, the lamina or block at uh, the articular process, block within thoracum, uh, thoracolumbar fascia. So what's the difference among those different approaches? I think uh, the person who asked this question means block of the lamina. This is the, probably the retrolamina lamina block. The block of the articular process, maybe this is the uh, thoracolumbar interfacial plane block and the block within the thoracolumbar fascia, this is uh, done by the erectospinal plane block. These blocks, are the, the end point of injection of the local anesthetics is very close together of all these blocks. But uh, for example, the retrolaminar block is a block uh, uh, mainly uh, done in the thoracic area. The thoracolumbar uh, interfacial block is a block for the lumbar area and only the erectospinal plane block is a block which can be done uh, in the thoracic or lumbar area. So uh, the clinical effect of all these blocks is nearly similar to the same. It depends on the volume which I use and it also depends how reliable with these blocks uh, can be blocked the spinal, the, the spinal nerves and how reliable uh, with these blocks can be blocked the sympathetic uh, fibers and therefore we can produce a uh, complete visceral and somatic analgesia. Very professional, yeah, very impressive. Um, still many, uh, many audience from many countries to ask questions. So I, I, I get a list of like uh, 30 of them. So I don't, I don't <laughs> think now we, we, we have enough time for that. So, but I will choose some very important for you to answer. Uh, the, yes. So next one, uh, the same, uh, the same topic like um, uh, for columbar fascia block. There are two different orientations. The one is parasagittal, the long axis one, and uh, the next is transverse, the short axis one, lat low to medium approach. So which which, which approach do you prefer in your clinical practice? So why? So in my clinical practice, I absolutely prefer the uh, transverse approach to the, when I do a thoracolumbar lumbar interfacial plane block. I have no or less experience with the uh, parasagittal approach. I think most of the publications also uh, are based on the transverse uh, approach for the thoracolumbar lumbar interfacial plane block. Okay, good. Um, the next one is from, uh, from a doctor in Indonesia. So his question is that uh, if we perform PAX1 or PAX2 for the breast surgery, should I do general anesthesia? Normally in our department here, we use these blocks not as a sole anesthetic, but we use it uh, in combination with uh, general anesthesia and we use it uh, mainly for post-operative analgesia after breast surgery. Okay, okay. So what was the difference between them? So uh, um, the PAX1, the advantage of the PAX1 and PAX2, the advantage of PAX2, there are any... Uh, I think the PAX, yes, the PAX1 block is, I, I think is a block which can be used only for very minor procedures. We use it, for example, the most we use it uh, for port implantation in, in cancer patients. Uh, these are completely pain-free, but you have to inject, infiltrate the skin because the skin of the breast from the, uh, uh, is innervated by the supraclavicular nerve from the cervical plexus. So if you do a cervical plexus and you do a PEX-1 block, uh, you can do minor breast surgeries, but the PEX-1 block does not cover any uh, uh, skin. Uh, so normally, usually we combine always PEX-1 with PEX-2 when we have a, a, a pain-free patient after breast surgery. All right, okay, good. Um, the next question is about, uh, is that what are the reliable indications for a successful block of the posterior branch of spinal nerve with block at the articular process? The rise of erector spine muscle, is there a point? Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, I think uh, we can block the posterior branch, uh, the, post the ramus posterior of the spinal nerve with uh, some with different kind of uh, the so-called paraspinal blocks. This is the retrolaminar block. This is the 
torque lumbar interfacial plane block, the erector spinal plane block. With all these blocks, we uh, reliable block the, the posterior ramus of the spinal nerve. It means we block, we have the skin blocked in the back of the patient and the skin of the autochthonous uh, uh, back musculature. Uh, if there is uh, a preference to one of the other of these blocks, as I mentioned before, the erector spinae can be done in the whole at the whole length of the uh, column vertebra, and the uh, retrolumina is uh, preferentially done in the uh, thoracic area and the uh, torque lumbar interfacial plane block in the lumbar area. But with all of these blocks, you consistently block the posterior, the, the dorsal or the posterior ramus of the spinal nerve. Okay, great. So I, I think uh, Professor Lau, uh, do, do, do you have any uh, comments on this? Professor, Frank. You can open your microphone, yeah. Please. Yeah, from the beginning, we, we usually block nerves and they we we block the faster, we perform the faster block. So today, by the lecture, we've learned a lot and a lot of questions be answered by, 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 by your lectures. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. OK, we'll, we'll continue. Yeah. Also, we have uh, other questions. And um, the next one is about, um, there are many chunk blocks currently under clinical practice. It is quite difficult for, for us to figure out which one, uh, uh, figure out the essential relationship between them. So can you just give us uh, any ideas of this? To answer this question might be a little bit difficult because we have so many blocks and uh, nearly every week or every month someone is publishing a new kind of block with a new uh, insertion of the needle somewhere else. Uh, we also have to keep in mind what I have shown in one of my slides uh, that we have for many of these blocks we have a lot of case reports or only case series but these uh, locks are not validated yet. That means we need, if we want to see if a block works very well for a special kind of operation, we have to compare this block against systemic opioids. This is the first. And then we have to do comparative studies with this new block compared to the uh, old fashioned blocks for this kind of operation. And then when this block will work very well and it will show that this block works better, then we can say this is a very new, well-working block. So uh, I think uh, when I look at all the, the new uh, thoraco lumbar uh, abdominal wall blocks, for me, the erectospinal block has the potential to become a very interesting block because we can use it for so many different kinds of operations. And uh, especially in the thoracic area, it is a very superficial and a very easy uh, uh, block. And uh, you can see very nicely the, the needle and the advancing of the catheter is also, can also be very nicely seen. And this uh, thoracic erector spinal plane block has a very low risk profile. So this is for me a block maybe with a high potential and also, in the thoracic area, you can do this block for major upper abdominal surgeries. So also for these kind of procedures, when uh, uh, more riskier blocks like the uh, thoracic epidural is not indicated, this block can be done. So we do, for a lot of minor abdominal surgeries in our department, we do this block bilaterally, but you have to keep in mind, when you do it bilaterally, uh, you, you have to take a high volume of local anesthetics and then the patient is at a higher risk of uh, systemic intoxication. But uh, I, sometimes I hear a lot of criticism about the new triangle blocks because these blocks are all interfacial blocks. That means you need a high volume. All these blocks are high volume blocks, especially when you do it, uh, these blocks bilaterally. And this is, not, this is uh, indeed in contrast to our uh, practice with ultrasound, 
when we use ultrasound for nerve blocks, uh, the major, one of the major advantage compared to nerve stimulation was that we can reduce the amount of local anesthetics to nerve stimulation uh, uh, so far. And uh, now we are, uh, for example, when we do an interscaline block with nerve stimulation, we have to use around 40 ml of local anesthetics. Now, with the, uh, in the area of ultrasound, we can use 8 to 10 ml of local anesthetics. But now when we are uh, talking about the interfacial plane blocks, which are blocks, uh, most of them are created in the area of ultrasound, we have to use lo a large amount of local anesthetics, 30, 40 ml. And if you do this block bilaterally, we have to use 50, 60 ml of local anesthetics. So we have to keep in mind this, uh, that patients with these interfacial plane blocks, these newer blocks, are at a higher risk of uh, local anesthesia intoxication. Yeah, good, good. So let's move on to the next one. Um, because there are many uh, beginners who start to learn uh, chunko blocks, they want to get advice or suggestions from you for some important tips and take home messages. So do you have suggestions for them? First of all, you must know uh, to, uh, you must know your, uh, machine, you must know how to do an uh, ultrasound guided block. You must always know where is the needle tip. Uh, this is, for example, one of the reasons why we, the, the incidence of, uh, of nerve damage is not lower up to now compared to nerve stimulation when we compare ultrasound with nerve stimulation because uh, many of the users of uh, the ultrasound technology do not know when they advance the needle, where is the needle tip. The second is you have to know to use the right block for the right operation. And uh, for my advice would be, we have, because we have so many of the uh, thoracic abdominal wall blocks, you should focus on one block for thoracic procedures maybe, one block for abdominal procedures, and maybe also we have alternatives also for uh, lower limb blocks, for example, when we do uh, uh, hip surgery. For the thoracic area, Probably the, uh, the erector spinal plane block is a good block to learn. Maybe also the PEX blocks or the serratus anterior block. Serratus anterior block is also a very good alternative for, uh, for uh, chest pain. And uh, for the abdominal wall block, you can use also the erector spinal plane block, or you can use the tap block, even if you know that the the, the analgesic potential of the tap block is not very low, but if you use a tap block uh, and compared to a patient with no tap block, you have an opioid sparing effect, effect of around 30%, and this can be important in some patients. And for hip surgery, for example, uh, in the past we used the uh, uh, lumbar plexus block or femoral nerve block, but we have a lot of alternatives for hip surgery, for major hip surgery, we can use a supraingual uh, fascia iliaca block, or we can use an anterior quadratus lumborum block, or we can do a lumbar erector spinal plane block. Lumbar erector spinal plane block and the uh, anterior quadratus lumborum block, these are blocks we are do more and more often in patients undergoing major hip surgery. Yeah, more useful information for all of the beginners who start to learn jungle blocks. Um, there is a question from the audience directly. Uh, he is asking regarding of the uh, This is very difficult from the pronunciation vocabulary. Uh, I try to. I will try my best to 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 uh, pronounce it. So, what's the best uh, approach for nephrectomy? Nephrectomy. Yeah, I think it's nephrectomy for for kidney. Yeah, kidney, relating to kidney. For kidney surgery, yes? No, kidney surgery, yes. The patient for major kidney you know, surgery, nephrectomy. What is yes, the, uh, the question is, what is the appropriate or the best approach for the... Uh, yeah, the best uh, for nephro nephro uh, nephrectomy, a patient... Nephrectomy, yes, yeah, for nephrectomy. Patient uh, posterior or lateral. So what your ex experience of uh, catheter insection is 12B? Uh, for nephrectomy, the gold standard in the past was uh, the uh, uh, thoracic epidural because it's a very painful procedure. With every breathing, the, the, the nephrectomy, 
that the kidney are placed just close to the diaphragma and with every breathing you will feel pain. Therefore, uh, patients need uh, a real well working block and uh, in the past thoracic epidural was a gold standard, but now in our department here, we uh, move away from the thoracic epidurals, we move to a uh, thoracic uh, epi uh, erectospinal plane block, or you can use also an uh, anterior quadratosombora block. And you can also use, uh, uh, I think the uh, thoracic erector spine is more appropriate because the, uh, the uh, quadratosombora block is uh, placed more closer to the to the, the to the operation side and the uh, thoracic uh, uh, erector spinal plane block is a little bit more away and even when you place a catheter it doesn't hurt the, the operation so these are the two options uh, two real very good options in patients undergoing nephrectomy all right very useful information for for the uh, anesthesiologist who want to uh this kind of a surgery yeah so uh, I, I don't think we have enough time, but uh, I got the last question for you. Okay, uh, yeah. I think time is up. So the last question is about, um, would you choose one of QLB or a fascia lica block for a neck of femur fracture or keep replacement? Is the guardian of uh, keep, re keep re replacement? Yes, I think I answered partly this question with my uh, last answer. Uh, for major hip surgery or neck fracture, hip neck fracture, I think uh, the uh, supraingual fascia iliaca block is an uh, attractive alternative, and also the uh, anterior quadratus lumborum block or the uh, thoracic or the lumbar erector spinal plane block. These three, these are three alternatives for the. Uh, uh, or these are analgesic options, very well working analgesic options in patients undergoing major hip surgery or proximal femur fracture or something else in this area. Okay, okay, very professional, yeah. Okay, okay. I think uh, time is up. So um, uh, let's say many thanks to you, uh, uh, Professor Paukes and to uh, Professor uh, Frank Law and also Thanks to all the audience who are with us today. It's time to say goodbye. So wish you all have a pleasant day, nice day. So if you want to uh, follow Wisani, we have Facebook or uh, LinkedIn for all of us to follow uh, all of the webinars in the coming days. Uh, do you have any comments, Professor uh, Kessler? No, thank you. I would like to thank uh, uh, Wisonic for organizing and inviting me for this uh, webinar. I enjoyed it very much and uh, very, very interesting questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Professor Law for the nice introduction thank also. You. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You. See you next bye -bye, time. Bye-bye. Okay. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's finished now? Yeah, it's finished. It's finished now.